Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Subscribers not only receive new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but also are able to interact with every contributor directly, including me, which... Hmm? So... If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as podcasts, videos, and other written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using links you're going to find below in the show notes. Well, I am very, very pleased to be sitting here talking with my good friend at this point, Brittany Sandoval. Hi, Brittany. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming. I, this is great. Brittany is a registered nurse an inclusive infant feeding instructor or educator, my apologies, and a podcaster in their own right. Because I believe I've already forgotten it again. Odd Mom Pod is correct. Yep. Yeah, right? Yep, the Odd okay. Mom Pod. There will be, there is, a, will, will be a link in the show notes. So please go and listen to Brittany because I think you will enjoy everything that they say. So Brittany discovered uh, the reason I'm talking to Brittany is is uh, they really discovered their story as part of generational trauma and this is really something that I've thought a lot about and clearly Brittany has as well and they have been able to heal through becoming a parent which if you look at the title of the show here the idea is is not only just childhood our own childhoods but also how we live through the lives of our children so Brittany, um, I want to say thanks so much for, for being here. I, I realize you've navigated all of this experience as you've also figured out you, you know, you've had to deal with your sexuality, your gender identity. And, and uh, so I want to sort of start there. I mean, give me give me just like the super short history on. I mean, how did how did you end up? You know what? I'm going to take that back. I want to start from from way far back. You talk now about your childhood and had finding yourself through you, through other people's childhood. Why is that? What affected you during your childhood that, that caused some of this? What's What got it started? Well, so growing up, I was like the statistic for any person that was born of of a child of a teen parent, actually. Um, and so my mother had me very young, um, in high school actually, and was in a really unhealthy marriage with my, at that time was her husband, my bio father. Um, but you know, they ended up divorced. My mom ended up in a domestic violence situation. Oh, I no. was sexually abused as a child, had a lot of trauma growing up. Um, yeah. And it wasn't until I kind of, I turned to a lot of unhealthy habits in high school, drugs, you know, sex, all of the, the things sure. to try and heal myself, trying to figure out who I was and make myself whole when so much had been taken from me so young. Um, and it wasn't until really like I became a parent and, you know, as a parent providing a childhood for a kid, you get to see how much that impacts them. But then also I became a foster parent and learned, have, have had the opportunity to have a, so much education on brain development and trauma and the right. importance of all of those pieces. Um, and honestly, through that training, parenting kids with trauma, I've kind of developed my own little way back to myself and using all of those pieces. And now my goal is to kind of help other people find that part of themselves too, which is partly right. why I'm here. Right. I have a couple of questions. Do, does your, so all, your, your registered nurse training, did that, does that include any, um, any trauma training? If, I, I don't, I don't know exactly what words I want to use there, but yeah, did, did it help any with, uh, processing your childhood? Um, honestly, not really. My, my, my medical training as much. Um, I mean, I think 
in school to be a nurse, you do learn about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And mm-hmm. like the basic stages of human development, which I think is is helpful to have like a basis of understanding from. Um, but it really wasn't until my like foster parenting training. Um, and I'm certified for like enhanced and therapeutic foster care. So that means that I've had training to be able to care for some of the most traumatized kids and the kids that are having the hardest oh, wow. behaviors in foster care. It wasn't yeah, until wow. that training that like I really started to learn how to put the pieces together of events that happened to how that currently influences how I feel and how I think and yeah. my reactions. Um, it, it's not until you kind of put all of those together that I really kind of started to figure out myself and be able to find my way. Right. Right. Do yeah, I'd love to talk a little bit about your childhood trauma. I don't, if this ends up being like something you don't want to answer, please just say, yeah, I don't want to talk about that. And, and yeah, we won't. Absolutely. Do, I mean, are you still, are you in touch with your biological parents at all? I am. Um, my mom has actually done a lot of work on herself over the last few years. Oh, great. Um, yeah. we're, we're still, we're still working. Um, I, but we have a very good we don't have a very good relationship. We have a really decent relationship and she's fantastic to my kids. And honestly, a lot of our healing relationship in our relationship has happened by me watching her like redo it over and be a great grandparent to my kids, even though, you know, those situations didn't weren't in line for her to have the resources to be a phenomenal parent in that situation, you know, but, but it's great. She's able, she's able to process some of her trauma. Cause I mean, we're, we're going to go into the generational aspect of this, but I mean, how did, I mean, how, how did the, the trauma that you, that you endured as a child, uh, how did that affect the rest of your life? I mean, I'll stop there. How did that affect yeah. you? Um, well, I mean, so a large chunk of the trauma that I endured was around, like where the, it got really bad was between when I was like six to eight years old. Um, mm-hmm. And so honestly, like it, it impacts every part of your life, right? Like your brain is just developing. Those neural pathways are just developing that builds the pathways and the bridge to how you are going to react and respond in situations for the rest of your life in that time period of your life. Sure, sure. And so um, it was hard. I mean, I, I did a lot of, a lot of years of I got addicted to very hard drugs by the time I was 14. Um, oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, between the ages of 14 and 17 are very patchy for me because I was um, I ended up dropping out of high school. I I was not in a good spot. Um, I suffered from anorexia and bulimia. At one point, I only weighed like 86 pounds. Um, oh, gosh. And so. Honestly, I mean, it it destroyed my life. It wasn't, it was difficult. I didn't have the coping skills to be able to work through my trauma. Um, I didn't really have the felt safety in my biological family to discuss a lot of my trauma. Even still, like, um, a lot of my trauma has not been discussed with my mom as we kind of talk about generational trauma. Um, Because I feel like she's still at a point where I don't know if she's worked through her own trauma enough to be able to like be ready to help me finish that part of mine, you know? I do. Yeah. I want to ask too. I mean, you could say, I mean, the, cause my question is just going to be, do you think it's possible ultimately to break out of this trauma? And, and I suppose you could say, well, I'm living proof, but you're still dealing with it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, honestly, that's kind of my whole, I don't know, spiel. I'm writing a book on it. I'm writing a keynote speak. It's all about how to process those parts of you um, to acknowledge who you are right now and use all of those parts of you to make plans and steps for intentional action to help you Mm -hmm. reach the outcomes that you want versus being stuck in that generational trauma. You can't ever escape it. You can't erase what happened to you. You can't pretend it didn't happen. Um, A lot of the things that happened to me were were difficult and hard, but they have also 
allowed me a different lens on how I handle kids with trauma or foster kiddos and the experience that they've been in. Um, And so I don't think there's any way to to uh, break out of the trauma or process it to where it doesn't impact your daily life. I think it's going to, but you have to be at the mental point where you're able to take all those parts of you and take intentional action to make sure that our repeated actions aren't stuck in that trauma response. Right. I I mean, this has been a lot of what I've written about um, over the past year having to do with like my sense of self-worth and my sense of how relationships, what is a healthy relationships, not even just self-worth, but even how other people should relate to me. Um, And you're right. I think that does ultimately affect everything we do, every relationship we have, every job we take, every, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend you get. Um, But also even like, I think sometimes we build up protective mechanisms where those same parts of us also inhibit our growth and, and, you know, so it's, it's a hard part of not allowing our, like, I don't want to say like damaged self-worth, but it is, you know, um, actually, did you know, I've learned this in my training that our self-worth is determined by the time we are eight months old. Eight months, no. Eight months, yeah. Foundationally in the brain. Foundationally in the brain, um, our self-worth is determined whether how well we were cared for in the first eight months of life and not only how consistently we were cared for, but how much delight our caregiver took in providing that care. That's stunning. Isn't that insane? And so you you have to think that, you know, even as a biological mother... I, I, did, I call myself mother. I'm not exclusive in that term by any means. But um, mm-hmm. as a mother myself, when I birthed my children, you know, those f- I s- suffered severely with postpartum anxi- uh, depression and anxiety afterwards. And those first eight months postpartum, like you feel like you're even hardly alive. Um, and sure. so I think it's important that we acknowledge that yeah, that's foundationally that way, but it's kind of our repeated experiences by our caregivers and the people around us throughout our childhood that really like solidify that in your brain. Right. I mean, you're, gosh, it's like, it's telling me that like, it's already so difficult. I mean, cause, cause you are tired. I mean, I, you know, we, we have a kid ourselves and I mean, it's, uh, meaning my wife and me, that's not like me and all the voices in my head. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, they're here too, but right, you know, right, right. Uh, we have to include sh- everybody. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> damn. What was I going to say? Oh, it, it's so difficult in those first, even six months. And, and that ends up affecting self-worth of, of the children. Like that's a bummer. Cause, cause like the deck's already stacked against every single one of us, no matter if you, if you have a great parent or a parent who's, who's, you know, reenacting some of the things that happened to them. That's a bummer. I mean, it is, but you also have to think of it as we're all at the same starting point, right? Like I True. feel like mm. it, it's, it's a reiteration to, teach kindness and to change the way we talk to our kids and change the way we talk to ourselves because you're right. Like those first eight months, we're all screwed, (laughs) but it's so tough. yeah, Yeah. But you, you know, I think knowing that and then knowing that each of the experiences beyond that really is what solidifies it. Right. So I I think, yes, we can say, yeah, it sucks because you know, the first eight months, it really kind of makes a foundation, but also that's a foundation and the repeated experiences and what they hear, we hear us say to other people or about other people, whether they're in the room or not, or whether, or how we talk about ourselves, even, you know, those are the things that when we're telling our, our bodies as, as the parent, our body isn't what it should be or, or I'm stupid or, Oh, I can't oh. believe I did that. You know, those are, that's what becomes the inner voice for your child. And, um, yeah. so I think it's, it, we can't look at it as like a downside. We have to look at it as like, okay, it's a foundation that we all have to kind of learn to be better and work to be 
better because it's it is important. That's a great point. A very good point. Um, can it? Can I go back to your mom for a moment? Yeah, and again, of if there's something, if there's a question I ask, let you go. No, too sensitive. Yeah. Um, statistically, I know I've, because I've done a lot of research on this, probably less than you, but you know, I've wondered what happened. Why were my parents like the way they were? Why did I get treated the way I did? And statistically, parents who were abused, parents who had you know poor uh, early childhood experiences, tend to you know, reenact those. I love that phrase, by the way, you've called that reenactment and I hadn't thought of it that way, but they tend to reenact them with their own children. Um, so it's really hard to end the chain. You know, you have a parent who gets a child and then, and then that ch child gets affected by whatever the parent went through. So, so I guess, you know, my first question, like, w was your mother, you know, were your parents, let me go with your parents, Did, were they abused as they were children? I mean, was this perpetuating that same chain? Um, my mom wasn't actually, but my, my side of the family, my, specifically my maternal side of the family, very deep back, dark goes, just honestly, they have like, um, I, I don't know how to put this without like being politically correct, but they, we have, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're not the, they're a little homophobic. They're a little transphobic. Okay. They're a little racist. They're a little, okay. it's, it's been a long family history of that. Um, and honestly, my sister and I are the first, like my sister came out as bisexual when she was like 18 and it was the way wow. that my family reacted as to why I, I'm out. I, I'm very open about who I am. My pronouns are posted where I'm at. Um, I talk about it often, but I've never actually had like a sit down with my family and been like, Hey, by the way, I'm this way. And this is be just because I know the interaction wouldn't go well. So, yeah, you know, I think they weren't abused in the same way. I do think a lot of what sure. happened to me was circumstantial. Um, being a child of a young single mother in the United States is just not really set up for success for most of those people. No. Um, the stereotypes or uh, patriarchal, you know, that a woman has to have a man in her life to be successful or a good mother when in a lot of times, a lot of the men that my mom brought into my life were actually the men that abused me. And, it's, it's just interesting. You know, I, I don't necessarily, my mom didn't have a similar, my, my grandparents are still married. Um, they had a, they didn't have my mom until a little bit older. My grandpa was in the military. And so like, she did have her own traumas in a different way. Um, I think a lot of the addiction is definitely a generational something that comes from my dad's side of the family that I definitely struggle with. Um, and his, my dad's family, is very unhealthy in their own way. His dad was an alcoholic and um, sexually abusive and domestically abusive to my um, aunts and uncle or my aunts. But um, my dad wasn't actually ever the perpetrator for any of my trauma, which is interesting. Yeah. Cause it's, I mean, I partly asked that question because, like, I know my mother had a difficult childhood and won't have to, to say much about that. My father, from what I understand, loved both his parents or pa his bo both of his parents were super duper supportive and loved him back. Um, and yet he was physically abusive to me. Like, what the hell? What the hell happened there? Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, a lot of it is just on a scope generationally from any generations previous to, you know, the few that are kind of really taking the reins on changing that generation. Anger yeah. was the only emotion and is still currently the only emotion that like men can outwardly express can and express. it be okay. That's a great point. Oh gosh. That's a great point. So, so I think, yeah, I mean, any, when we, learn about emotions, you know, anger is actually a secondary emotion. Um, mm. and often 
the outburst or dysregulation of that emotion of the innate like root emotions of feeling disappointed or disrespected or you know however they're feeling they suppress those until it becomes a explosive secondary emotion and so honestly yeah. i think generationally our biggest issue is that we haven't taught emotional regulation emotional understanding or self awareness throughout childhood right. and right i feel like that's a large reason of where so much generational trauma comes from oh i think you're right i mean instead what we're teaching is go get a passport and like cross the border and boink your brains out you know and then come back home because you don't have to worry about whoever it is you just left i mean it like this is this is okay behavior for for men like we train men exceptionally poorly but that actually, I mean, almost kind of plays into, like... We also train women to be okay with that behavior. Ooh. Ooh, that's a good point. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, how, especially, you know, in today's world, being a gender queer person, you see how much the patriarchy and all of that, like, people are cisgender people are afraid of trans transgendered women because they're thinking that like you're somehow taking their rights because there's right. just no understanding of i don't know emotional regulation and how to manage yeah. that and i don't even know where i'm going with this but it's like it's we are training women to feel that way as well right right my opinion is that what we do is is tell people don't look inside yeah. Don't look at your identity. Don't think about gender. Don't think about sexuality. These have been defined for you. Just take the roles we're going to give you. Suck it up. Maybe your life's going to be terrible. Suck it up. And and I think that is the origin of so many sad people out there, unhappy people, angry people. And, and so some of this is lashing out. I mean, I, I don't think personally, I, think a lot I don't of think it people is... would want to be. Yeah, I think a lot of it's projection. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I think a yes. lot of it's projection, yes. too, you know? Mm -hmm. A lot of these people feel this way about them in, themselves inside, but they've right. managed to keep it together, or they've managed to ma make a life that looks like they're happy, regardless <laughs> right. of whether that they're not. And so they just expect that everybody should have to do that, too. And I'm like, no, thanks. I would yeah. like to be happy in who I feel that I am and not mm -hmm. who you say I have to be. Right. But we're like, we're, we're also okay with like social media happy, right? Then she go, well, on Facebook, look, I checked, I've got a selfie of me with like the Statue of Liberty or something. I don't know. For some reason, the yeah. Statue of Liberty came out. <laughs> I'm here with like the St. Louis Arch. I don't care. The Parthenon, whatever. But we've taken a picture, <laughs> taking a selfie and saying, look at how great my life is. Here I am, you know, doing whatever. And like half the time, probably more it's untrue. Like much of our life is much of our lives is, is filled with misery. And we're like, I better go see the statue of Liberty before I, you know, I don't know yeah. where I was going to go with that, but I'm <laughs> glad I bit it off. So no, I think there's a question. I think of, it's, Oh, sorry. I was going to no, 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 actually go ahead and finish, finish. Um, I think I personally, when, when people look at my life, and kind of the way that I presented my life. So after my drug abuse and eating disorder, I actually got heavily into the church. <laughs> um, and wow. it, it did save my life. Honestly, I probably would not be allowed or would be a lot. I would not be alive if, if I wouldn't have found the sure. church at that time. Um, yeah. Was heavily in the church for many years and deconstructed and then figured out, oh, yeah, like I'm kind of gay. And I actually don't know if I'm only a woman, you know? <laughs> um, but when people outside of my life look at my life, especially people who feel like the only way to find true happiness is to be in a heterosexual marriage with multiple children, like that's the dream, right? Um, yeah. that, those parts of me were probably the deepest, darkest parts of my life, you know, yeah. like internally yeah. and mentally, but on the outside, when, we were at Easter Sunday church and we, you know, all of that, like we, that's when we were playing that we were the happiest. And I genuinely, those are some of the hardest memories of my life. 
Oh, interesting. Because just to, <clears throat> I mean, I think you just answered the question, but just, just to clarify, when you say the church, we're talking the Christian church, presumably. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. We were big in the evangelical Christian space for a while. Okay. So sorry, I'm a pagan. So I can think. Well, I don't know. This is like the yeah, church. Like, what of, kind of you know. Yeah, there's a lot of churches out church there. Church of Satan. I just, yeah. Church of, right. I'm like, actually, I love that <laughs> so, one. <laughs> like how the tables yeah, have turned. Well, That's the only know. church I follow on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> the Church of Satan. Good yeah. times. Their stuff is actually um, really interesting. Have you ever read about them? Like read about their beliefs? Um. When I was, yes, when I was younger, yes, because much of it is based, because it's Anton LaVey who is basing a lot of things on, on mis, uh, on contextually poor quotes of, of Aleister Crowley. And I've done a lot of research on Aleister Crowley. So, so yes, I'm somewhat familiar, but actually throw it out because li- there are probably people going, yeah, but I'm not. Shut up, Amy. So go talk. Well, yeah, no. So, um, so the Church of Satan, we don't, they don't actually believe in Satan. That because no. Satan is a is a Christian principle, um, obviously. <laughs> right. So um, I think it's funny because most people think that you know the Church of Satan they're like worshiping devils and skinning cats in the bottom of like a like an arroyo. Like that's what like people well, in my life who are very heavily in the Christian the, church think the, that Satan worshippers are. You know? Yeah, I I think I think the skinning cats that may be true. That yeah. that part may be true actually, but. Really? Hey, I love cats, everybody. I love cats. I really I do love cats, love cats. too. Do you? See, I, I love cats. Yeah. This is I why I like two. you. See, it's because of the cat thing. Right? <laughs> it is. They connect my, everybody, my cats really. Sit by the fireplace. Right. Well, yeah, most people go, connect? No, mostly what they do is ignore me. <laughs> yeah. But that's not the point. So, sorry. Skinning cats was not, it's untrue. No cats yeah. were harmed in the making of this podcast. No, absolutely none. None at all. No, really. <laughs> um, a lot of their, their stuff is just about bodily autonomy, being kind to other yes. people, caring about right, yourself right. and relationship to yourself. And, um, I, I think it's, I feel like it gets a lot much worse of a rap than I had ever anticipated until I started looking into it. But it's yeah, actually really yeah. quite interesting. Definitely not what I expected when I was first looking up the Church of Satan, for sure. Right. No, it's a great point. I mean, much of it is is primacy of nature, which is a big pagan concept, Yeah, that's of course, a big pagan you know, thing. of the earth. So it's, yeah, so... Yeah, I'm um, still figuring that part of myself out as, you know, I've, yeah. as a deconstructed evangelical Christian, I've kind of, I, I love the, I'm, I don't, I don't like to say I'm like witchy, but I love like connection with the elements and mm-hmm. I feel like I'm big about like the gravitational pulls and um, I've just recently gotten into astrology. Oh, oh goodness. Gosh, okay. Yeah. It's been an adventure. I'm learning a lot. <laughs> That's Yeah that's going to end up being a huge, just even, even astrology, but you know, or maybe you don't, um, we, let's see, I think it's on, I think it's on Sunday. I'm trying to remember. I think, I think the the dark moon is on Sunday Okay. and I'm going to ask you this question, which again, you can f- feel free to tell me like right now m- my boobs are extra sore. Yeah. Because they are more sore for me anyway. Or the, she's checking everybody. Ooh. If you're listening, she's, <laughs> I'm like, no, but I mean, I feel like they're pretty okay. <laughs> well, damn. So thanks for screwing up my, but <laughs> usually, usually during the dark moon, I, I get extra sore. Like I got out of bed this morning, I'm leaning over and I'm standing up. And I'm like, Ooh, oh, I hate sore boobs. I, unless you ever right. experience that, you genuinely don't know how uncomfortable it is. Cause they move oh, all no. the time. Like every yes. breath. <laughs> right. I know I'm, st- I'm just standing up. I'm like, they're not even that big. What is, you know, but if I roll, I'd roll over and I'm like, oh, because <laughs> they're leaning. Oops, I hit my mic. Leaning over. And then, you know, anyway, the point is dark moon, like with the phases of the moon uh, affect us so much. It's actually very um, surprising how much, you know, the, the dark moon and the, the full moon, like how much that affects behavior. Yeah. And your energy. And for what it's just worth. All of it. Yeah. And, and that shifted for me when I started hormone therapy too, because it used to be the full moon was weird for me. And now the dark moon is weird or well, less weird than the full moon used to be. But now full moons, I'm just like, oh yeah, full moon. Cool. You know, (laughs) which is odd because I would have weird, weird moments 
anybody who knows me is like, what do you mean weird? The whole life was weird. But anyway, let me move on because I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah. <laughs> Don't misunderstand me. Church of Satan's great. But <laughs> <laughs> No, and that's why I'm, I'm just, I love learning about like all of the different, I don't know a ton about paganism. I've read a little bit mm. here and there, but I've heard really great things. Um, honestly, I think it's, I've heard it's very similar in like connection to the elements and things like that. Correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I am a Druid and pr okay. in particular, so both Druidry and Wicca, I'm going to do this folks. Sorry. No, so I love it. I'm Druidry so for it. Wicca. <laughs> Okay. So the guy who ended up developing Wicca, Gerald Gardner, was actually friends with Ross Nichol. They Ross Nichols, who who is the the modern founder of of Druidry. And so that actually the two of them together really kind of put together much of of what informs modern paganism. And this was back in the uh gosh, I think late 40s and early 50s because I think it was 1952 that Gerald Gardner wrote his first book. I want to say maybe 52 or 53. Because there was actually a law banning witchcraft until 1951, I think, 1951 wow. in Britain. And for some reason, that was repealed. Like, I don't even know who was, like, looking through law books and went, oh, gosh. What's a good British name? Nigel. Oh. <laughs> say, say, Nigel, we should really we should really repeal these laws against witchcraft. And I say, my good man, you're right. <laughs> You should get rid of those. You know, anyway, fifty-one, but they are all based on on being in in tune with the earth. Like you know, paganism, a pagan religion, is not non-Christian. That was that's an, a, usually yeah. how Christians think of as pagan because they'll be like, I don't know, Muslims, they're weird. That's that's pagan too. No, actually, it's a it's a form of Judeo-Christian. You know. It's, Abrahamic, yeah. sorry. It's an Abrahamic strain there. Anyway, moving on, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, you, Druidry has a lot to do with the elements, the directions, um, you know, colors and and plants and uh, being in touch with your surroundings. My personal opinion, everything ultimately kind of has a soul. And this mm -hmm. is called pantheistic, actually. It means that the universe itself is is the goddess. So like my, my purple, you know, bottle here has a soul. I don't want to mistreat this because if I do, I don't know, yeah. actually, what would happen if I mistreated you? I don't know. I feel You're like gonna... for me, I guess I've always thought that like, we're all one connected energy. And so if you yes. give out negative energy, you receive negative energy. So yes, agreed. That's kind of where I'm at with that, agreed. I guess. It's been an yeah. interesting so, self-exploration, which is honestly, that's yeah. kind of how I found myself was, you know, kind of deconstructing and figuring out that like, yeah. oh, hey, when you are gay, when you're drunk, you're probably gay all the time. You're just hiding it the rest of the time. <laughs> it's a great point. Yeah. You know, I, actually, because now I can actually shift things right back. I always do this. So I'll always end up taking this big, long tangent. Then finally, somebody goes. Hey, what the hell are we talking about? Oh, yeah, we were oh, talking yeah, about being gay. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> right. So, so the question I was going to ask you like 10 minutes ago, because I, I like to think of, you know, I have been told, and, and we, I think we get taught, that we only can understand like what we've observed. And I've actually even written this and gone, well, you know, you don't understand it unless you experience it. And, you, and that's why generational trauma is so difficult, because you don't know that you can choose differently. Do you agree with that at all? A hundred percent. I literally do even you? just okay. said, yeah, I do. I think as a parent, that's been one of my main goals is I want to introduce as many people into my kids' lives because unless you know those people, you see them circumstances, you know them as humans and you humanize their experience. Can you really okay. like learn about that experience? I okay. never like growing up being gay or anything other than what you're assigned at birth was like an option or discussed or talked about. And it wasn't until right. I got older and started to realize that that is an option, I guess, right. That you kind of then can reflect on yourself and see how that plays a part of you. If that makes sense. 
it makes total sense. And by the way, you just totally turned my question. That was beautiful. Thank you, Brittany. Because I was <laughs> going to so say welcome. what I experienced was abuse. Mm -hmm. And so statistically, I should be abusing my son because that's what I know. And I cannot choose otherwise. But what you just told me, which was beautiful, is that inside me is not the ability to abuse my son. Really? Yeah. Because you said, you know, you've always been, you've always been, you know, gay or pansexual, I think is how you, mm -hmm. how you put it on your profile. Um, wow. Actually, you killed off a whole line of, of, of conversation, <laughs> but in a really, really in good way. way. <laughs> <laughs> right, in the best way possible. I mean, but to get, I mean, to get back on that at least a little bit, I mean, do, do you think that there is, is there like a general way that we can break down some of these emotional and, and trauma scars, generational trauma? Is there like a general way or does that need to be inside us? Um, I think a lot of it has to come from self-reflection. Like you have mm -hmm. to kind of get into the mindset of being ready and able to reach those parts of yourself because it's going to take mm -hmm. practice. This isn't something we were, this isn't something we were modeled. This isn't something we were taught to do. And right. so, right. you know, I think that's the biggest thing is being patient with yourself. And for me, like it started out like meditation is something that so many people recommend that I was kind of like, yeah, I cannot do that. Um, because I would try and sit down and do like a 20 minute meditation the first five times that I meditated and I could never get myself to the point where it was, you know, like therapeutic or actually helpful. Um, right. so I think honestly, the biggest thing is just acknowledging that it's going to hurt. It's, you have to be ready for it. Um, and starting small, like even taking the next time you feel like a big type of emotion or feel some type of way about something, break down and be like, I'm angry. No, but actually I'm not angry. I'm feeling sad because I really wanted to do this. Or I'm actually feeling really frustrated because I felt like my time was disrespected. Or I'm actually feeling um, abandoned. Or I didn't feel like my needs were met in that interaction. And when you can break it down to more like I'm angry at that person, you can really kind of start to figure out, well, why do I react that way? Oh, maybe that's because that's how I was modeled to react. And, you know, it, you kind of have to break it down and work it down that way. Um, but I think getting to know yourself and really acknowledging those root feelings is the first and most important thing that you can do to kind of re-get to know yourself. I So I completely agree with this. There's, we talked earlier the, about uh, we talked earlier about like men. I, I mentioned the passport bro thing that's come up now that you fly somewhere and whatever and come home, it's leaving a string of broken hearts. If if these men sat down and thought about it, I, I would guess. I mean, if you think about it honestly, I would guess these these men would think it would think that they were despicable. And that's a hard conclusion to come to, and many people don't want to do it. And I guess that's that's kind of where I, where I'm going is that it it does mean it does mean having to face the probability that that you're a jerk in one way or another. Well, and yeah. I'm using jerk pejoratively, <laughs> and I shouldn't, but you have engaged yeah. in behavior that perhaps you now regret. Was that better? Yeah. That no, for sure. And I think, I mean. I think we have to go into it with the reminder that like, we are all going to fuck up. We're all fucked up. Like, you know, like there's no, sorry, I didn't even ask if you allow cussing on your podcast, but. Oh, I totally do. Yeah. Hang okay. On. I was like, I drop F bombs oh. on mine all the time. So I just wanted oh, to be fuck. sure. I can't believe you just fucked up my podcast. Fuck not to start the whole I, thing over. <laughs> no, I want you to know I'm leaving that in there. There are people right now going, oh yeah, <laughs> totally normal. Okay, good. So anyway, but, yeah, you know, I but think we are gonna we are gonna screw we up. We are gonna so. mess up. Yeah, and I think I think acknowledging that like we're all in the human experience for the first time. I think that we also forget that. None of us have done this 
or lived this exact experiment, experiment, well, experience, right. right. You haven't lived this exact, this exact experiment, yeah. experience. Why do I keep saying experiment? <laughs> it is an experiment. Do you Life want to go is back to say, just say fuck again and we'll yeah, be okay. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck, let me start over. You know, but I think we have to remember that, like, we're all in our this human experience with this set of circumstances with our group of people and our own wants, needs, emotions. Like, we're all just doing it for the first time in this situation. So, like, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is that, like, acknowledging, yeah, you're going to fuck it up. Like you're going to mess up. You're going to, it's yeah. going to be hard. And I think it also gets harder the m- more deep you get into that trauma. Like it gets harder oh before gosh. it gets better. Yes. Um, yes, yes. So I think it's just knowing that like, it's okay to mess up. And I think taking accountability and like saying like, mm, before I knew what I know now, I felt this way and I'm really apologize or I said this or, you know, um, and I didn't mean that the po- stuff that I posted about gay people not being able to be married and being pro-life, you know, six years ago are definitely not something that I agree with now as I found out who I am and what I believe in. Sure. And so sure. I think it's important to be able to like, instead of erasing that part of us, we're like, yeah, at one point I did say some really fucked up stuff saying like, yeah, I, I said some fucked up stuff and I've learned and I've gained experience and I've met people and I've broadened my own horizons and now I don't feel that way. And I was looking at our notes too, cause I know we were going to talk about doing that with our kids, but I think that's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> one of the ways we like heal the scars that we inflicted on our children when we were like bringing it back is apologizing and taking oh, accountability. Sure. Yes. Yes. That's, you know what? I mean, because I was you, your own story, you started doing this because you had your first child. Is that is that why you started investigating yourself more closely? No, actually, it wasn't until um, I was locked inside at the pandemic and uh, oh. found lesbian TikTok. And then I really started to figure out myself. <laughs> so how how old were how old were your kids at that point? Um lesbian tiktok i'm taking Dude. a note hang on yeah okay for real though some of those woodcutters on tiktok they have the most incredible arms and backs i've ever seen in my life all right so I, so true confessions here i have looked at those okay i know what you're talking mm-hmm. about i didn't realize i didn't realize that's what we were talking because i thought that was absolutely and completely you know they no. were just they were like instructional videos no, nope. no, they are not. They're total thirst traps for us that oh, we're I not sure we were no, gay. I know, I know. <laughs> no, I know, I know, I know. Because they're always wearing like, you know, stirrup pants. And right. Yeah, and I like the ones like, that like, like pull the natural. With... The, I like the natural looking one where they have like their, they look like they're actually like lumberjacks. I'm like, mm-hmm, I can get behind that. And it, that sounded <laughs> wrong. <laughs> All right. I I always see. I always see. Always see. Sorry. This is more of a true confession than I thought it would be. But I I tend to see people with like like skin tight pants that I'm like mm, that's even like a like a size too small. I mean you yeah. you got skin skin tight pants that are even too small. But uh, that's generally what I see with like boots. There's always like knee high boots. I don't know yeah. why that's sexy, but it kind of is the knee high boot. It is. it is a it thing. is a thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Um, because like I live in I live in Colorado, so as soon as the snow starts falling, like run up right around November or something like that, I'm always like, oh, the boots are out. Oh, boots. Hey, boots. <laughs> hey, um, boots. <laughs> anyway, wow, we should get back to oh, scars. That's what it was. So, yeah. <laughs> how old were your kids then when you started doing some of this, some of this work? Um, let's see if I. Started figuring myself out in 2020, so like six. My oldest was six, okay. and then I had okay. um, like a four year old and a two year old. Did you so, need to do much apologizing? Uh, yes, in different ways. Okay. Um, yeah. For me, it was more. I didn't learn how to regulate my own anger for a long time. And so I was somebody who was big on like emotionally yelling or, um, I 
don't know. I, I, uh, yelling is kind of my big one that like, I feel bad about, I guess. Um, sure. But I think a lot of it and what I've apologized for most has been like times when I haven't respected them as a human, you know, when I haven't acknowledged their feelings in a situation or kind of blown them off or uh, blown off their yeah. experience is like invalid, which is really easy to do when you're a parent because, oh, yeah, you know, it's really easy to do. So I think that's yeah. been the, the biggest thing. Um, I was very thankful that I did a lot of like my own working through my addiction and working through my eating disorder and things like that before I had children. So thankfully I was in a much better mental space through all of that. So my kids were never, never had that experience of me being like an inconsistent parent or, um, I don't know, like an emotionally unavailable or unstable parent. So my kids never sure. have had to experience that thankfully. Um, but I mean, I apologize to my kids every day. I fuck up every day. You know, I'm human. Like that's part of it. Like that's part of it. And I think, we can't expect our kids to, right. I'm like, I think we can't <laughs> right? expect our kids to learn how to apologize and learn how to be decent to other people or respect other people. If we don't respect them Unless, or don't teach them. Yeah. Oh gosh. I know. I, it was interesting right when we had our kid, you know, we, we were being told, Oh, well, you know, you want to make sure you're, you're super, you super baby them. And they're, you know, they're very fragile. And we're like, well, but he's also a, like a, human i mean you know you have to treat the treat your children as humans and and i mean even at like two years old i'm seeing people like totally negate what um gosh i sounded so valley girl there <laughs> <laughs> it just cra it, like it stood right out of me when i said i'm looking at people like totally disrespecting their children and you know i mean <laughs> gag me with a spoon on that anyway my apologies yeah. to everybody in the uh the world here but disrespecting their children i'm like what are you doing they're like well kid's only two what does he know what does he know you're disrespecting all, that's him. it he knows that's that all he knows anything yes well, and that's all so, he knows is that he should deserve that respect or that level of right. action and then you know that goes into right. breaking generational curses if if you treat your children that way that is how they are going to experience relationship. They are going to yeah. continue to seek those relationships of people that treat yes. them like that because that feels safe. And then it just yes. continues to go round and round and round. So I, this, this is a, this will sound like a dumb question, but was it, was it lesbian TikTok that made you say, that's it. I'm going to break this chain. Um, no, I don't honestly, I think more for me, it was, foster parenting that was really like I, I my interactions matter the things I say the mm. things I do yeah. the way I model um that I think was the real big point when I was like oh like if I want to change the actions of my children I have to change my reactions to situations mm -hmm. you know yeah. and so um honestly no it wasn't until like foster parenting and teaching my children that way, I guess lesbian TikTok was the first thing for like the J gender, <laughs> gender queer flag for me. Okay. But, um, I mean, it wasn't the first one. There were many before that I ignored very well for a long time. Were, no, of course they were. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but I, that I was mean, the I first know. time that I started to like, like be like, okay, who am I and where do I fall in this world versus yeah. – like where I've been told I'm supposed to be and being yeah. in a heterosexual marriage, like my spouse and I, we've been married 12 years this year. Um, so we've wow. been married a long time. Um, we got married when we were very young and very heavily in the church. And so, you know, I think I hit a lot of that for a long time cause I wasn't sure how he was going to react either. Um, but thankfully he's like, yeah, that's cool. I don't really care. <laughs> he's like, okay, good. That's yeah, good. he's been fantastic um, and been honestly the only reason that I've probably been able to find myself is because I've been in a partnership with somebody who's so supportive of like allowing me to do that, you know? Right, right. That that helps so much, so, so much. You're, so you you have had both a gender and sexuality journey. Yeah. Or I guess journeys. 
I don't. Yeah. Know. Yeah. On. So um, I came out. So I figured I always kind of knew I was on the bisexual spectrum um, from pretty young. But when my sister came out and all hell broke loose, I was like, Nope, won't be me. Like I won't do Close that. Close the doors. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and I had found a partner in a heterosexual male, which I did not ever. Honestly, there's very few out there that I would probably consider settling down sure. with. <laughs> sure. Um, but it was really hard to kind of f- come out and figure myself out, being that I'm in a happily heterosexual marriage. I have children. Um. But I just wasn't happy with – I just didn't feel fulfilled in who I was. I just felt like something was always sure. kind of missing, you know? Um, so the sexuality thing came first for me. Um, okay. And I originally at first had came out as kind of bisexual. And then as I started learning more about the LGBTQ community and kind of submersing myself more into that, um, I was like, actually, I'm not bisexual. I'm more pansexual. Um, I – find sure. attraction honestly more to trans men and things like that than than most cisgendered humans at this point um and so that was the first turning point and i don't think it was until i started to have interactions and attraction with people of other genders and starting to learn more about what being gender fluid feels like like, like i don't I don't know. I guess I was always like a tomboy. I didn't fit into like the girly mold. I was always like the sporty kind of person. I've always felt very masculine. Um, but no, I hadn't, hadn't had anybody explain it to me or allow me to process it until I started sure. meeting oh, sure. other people who were gender fluid, you know? Yeah. Yes. Um, and so honestly, the coming out as non-binary and really kind of figuring out where I am in the gender fluid space has been very recent with, within this year. Um, oh, gosh. But, oh, that yeah, is quick. But I've, okay. Yeah. But I've, yeah. Um, but I've been out pansexually since about 2021 with my spouse. So. Well, that's good. No, that's yeah. good. <clears throat> so we started talking about this. We're, we're, um, we're starting to run a little bit low on time. Yeah. But we started talking about this before I hit record. Um, so you're now gender fluid and obviously fluid in your sexuality. People have called people like you and me groomers that, that your kids are going to turn into, you know, gender weird people and in sexual deviants, just like my kids are going to turn into mm-hmm. weirdos, you know? Yeah. Are we, are we, are we building new weirdos in, in what, uh, in what we do, Brittany, in your professional opinion, Brittany? Honestly, and professionally, I hope so. No, I'm just kidding. No, I mean, no. and here's, I, but like, that's honestly, that's what it is. Too. I like, I, I hope so. I hope that the, yeah. like, the, the presence that I give off and the space that I create for my children, that they feel comfortable exploring that as a child. Like, yeah. so you know, I want them to know that part of themselves and not have to experience 20 years, 30 years of hiding who they are. Um, so, I mean, I think I address all of my children the same way. I have three biological girls and we have one, um, foster son who we will be, um, hopefully adopting in the next few months. Um, gosh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, it's not, it's hard adoption from foster care is hard. Like it's exciting for him to be in a permanent place, but also means that he had to experience a lot of trauma and difficulty. So it's like, yeah. you know, a double edged sword. Um, cause I hate that he will yeah. never be able to go back to his bio family or have safe ties with them. That's a good point. But you know, but also I'm very thankful that he's in our family and we love him very much and who he is and what he brings to our family. But that's a whole other conversation. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, being raised in a gender fluid household, like my kids all play with the same toys, which means my son loves playing Barbie dolls and hair. And, you know, he loves wearing hair bows. He loves wearing a good hair bow. And I love that for him, you know, but I am in my household growing up, that never would have flown. Like that would have not been allowed. Um, Oh, sure. Yeah. So I think, Yes, maybe in a way, are we allowing kids to be more out? Are they, are they more likely to be out? 
yes, because they have the safety to do so and a support to do so. I don't necessarily think that we're turning kids gay, but we are allowing kids to experience who they really are and letting them know that there's not a construct they have to follow. Right. I agree with that. That what we have, what, what you and I are doing is giving people the space to find who they are. Yeah. And maybe that means they'll find out they're gay. Maybe that means they'll find out they are transgender. Maybe they'll find out a bunch of things, but that's not really a bad thing that we learn about who we are. So, well, and I think so many people think inclusion somehow exposes kids to things that then like turn them a certain way. But I think, you know, when we, when we tie it back to like our experiences, you, It's just they hadn't experienced that. And I want my kids to be able to experience a lot of things so that they can figure out what they like. Because I want them to be truly fulfilled in themselves, not from outside societal pressures. Yes. No, I completely agree. And I think that is a great place for us to to cut it. Um, Brittany, is there... So I I mentioned we're going to have... I will, I have a, a link to your podcast that will be in the show notes. How else can people reach out to you? Is there a good way to get in touch with you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram. Um, you can find me Brittany Sandoval RN. Um, okay. I also have one for my podcast, um, the odd mom pod. Um, and even though it is, called the odd mom pod i only call it that because i um identify as mom my kids call me mom but we're inclusive of everybody considering i'm non-binary um and we do guest interviews from people and parents of all walks of life so um i would love to have anybody who's interested in learning how to kind of parent outside of the norm or kind of parenting outside of what you expected to be parenting i did not expect when i had children as a 20 year old christian woman to be raising my children (laughs) as a pansexual non-binary person like you know it changes how you parent and so um that's kind of what my podcast is is just a community for people who are looking to expand and their perspective yeah i i love it personally i love it and and Thanks. uh maybe, i would love to have you, you you'll have to come again. uh-huh i would All love right. to talk more about your parenting right, experience and what that's been like for you because <laughs> it's it's been weird but uh i think uh i think it would be a good story so i would love to hear it well so, Brittany, I want to say thank you so much, and, and I want to thank all of my listeners, or all of our listeners, because you, yours are here, too, supposedly. Who knows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's the hope, right? <laughs> but, yeah, right, right. What I, Where was that going? That was ridiculous. But so, but I am Amethyst Herrick. This is Gender Identity Weekly. I've been speaking with Brittany Sandoval, and uh, we will talk next time. Thank you. Thanks so much.